I don't know how you cut down to London in full consultation. I don't know how you do it. What? Drive down to London for full consultation. It's a, it's a real pain, but I've got to see you. <laughs> it, it took us over two hours to get you, so I'm really sorry, and we, then um, uh, my um, sat nav is old, and the little street is new. So I'm not on the system, so that's one of the issues. What do you like? So um, I'd like to thank everybody for coming to talk to you about clinical trials. And so what I wanted to discuss is this issue of neuroprotection and why we need neuroprotection. So most, most of you will know if you've got progressive MS or relapsing disease. Do you know that? So who's got progressive MS? So the majority of people have got progressive MS. And who's got relapsing disease? Oh, sorry, I'm not progressive. I'm primary. You mean both primary and secondary? And secondary, yes. Okay. So one of the problems we have in the field is that people with progressive disease feel very, very let down because there are no treatments available for you. And I think the reason there are no treatments is because we haven't really understood progressive MS as well as we should in the past. And we've had to learn many, many lessons. And I think we're beginning to learn the lessons. And I just want to do, take you through one of the lessons. And in retrospect, I learned the lesson many years ago. And why isn't this working? So this is a personal story. So you see this picture is a, a, a man on a, on a uh, dialysis, kidney dialysis machine. So this is somebody with renal failure and they have to go onto a machine to, to, clean, to clean the toxins out of their blood. It's called hemodialysis. And my father needed hemodialysis. When I was 12, he was diagnosed with chronic renal failure and had to go onto hemodialysis. And the problem with my dad is that when he actually got to the... Um, kidney doctors, and nephrologists, <clears throat> they said to him they couldn't do anything for him because his kidneys had got to such a state and they were all shrunken up that it was too late to, to treat his condition. And he had, had, he had an autoimmune disease of the kidney uh, called IgA nephropathy. It's a technique. And basically, it's like a mess of the kidney. And so the, the, the problem with my father is he never was picked up early in life with his, with his autoimmune disease, he presented at the end of the damage. And there was nothing to say. And certain autoimmune diseases are like this. Does anybody have any family or friends with type 1 diabetes? Diabetes? Have to inject themselves with insulin? So the problem about diabetics is exactly the same. By the time they present with their diabetes, they've had their autoimmune disease, the disease attacking their cells in the pancreas, for 10, 15 years. Now, MS is different because we have an opportunity to interact with the disease before it causes what I call end organ damage. Uh, and this is what end organ damage looks like. This is a normal brain of somebody who dies in the late 50s. And this is of somebody with advanced multiple sclerosis. You can see how MS affects the brain. And so what we all want to try and do is prevent that. And I'll come back to that issue. So at least with MS, people present with relapses clinical attacks or early progressive disease before the, the, the damage is done so we can uh, get in with therapies to protect those nerves and stop them from dying. Now this is one of the best and one of the worst slides ever in multiple sclerosis. So you all heard about that drug called Campath that was invented in Cambridge and it's now called Alemtuzumab and it's now got a trade name called Lentrida and it's been licensed for use in relapsing MS since August of last year. And we're beginning to treat people with this, with this drug. And it's, a very, it's probably the most effective drug we've got. But according to this slide, it has to be given in a very specific stage of the disease. So this here is people with very early relapsing disease, given the drug. And this drug stops you having relapses. It switches off those lesions coming and going on your MRI. And most of the people who go on the drug actually see an improvement in disability. So if they're having problems walking on the drug, their walking improves. I'm not saying getting back to normal, because this is actually a scale. That's getting worse, that's getting better. And you can see all the people's ribbons, which is their scores over time, are improving. So there's a significant proportion of people who have this drug in the early phases are getting better. Now at the same time, Professor Comston and Professor Coles in Cambridge treated people with secondary progressive disease with the drug. And what happened was, it stopped them having any relapses if they were still having relapses. And it stopped all those new lesions coming. But you can see what happened to all these people. Instead of going down, their disability is getting worse. 
I mean, but you can't see it yet. I wasn't do this. You can see the disability over there is getting worse. So because of this, they say there's a window of opportunity to treat MS, and we should only treat relapse in early disease, and these people, we shouldn't leave alone, we can't do anything about the second progressive phase, because people continue to get worse. Now what's hidden in this slide actually is the clue that people may do well on this road. Because if you look at this slide, I'll go back to the arrow here, is that group of people at the end there are doing badly. These people here are not doing too badly. About a third or even maybe more than a third of these people. We can't see the arrow. Oh. Yeah, we can't so see the arrow. Yeah. Okay. It's got the, the pointer, yeah? Yeah. There's a pointer. It's a pointer. Ah. So what you can see over here is these people are doing badly. But these people here seem to be stabilizing. So I actually think they didn't they made an assumption that all these people were getting worse and the struggle weren't working yet, but they never ever compared this therapy, this group of patients, to what we call a placebo or a comparator. That's the critical thing in clinical trials. Is you have to compare your treatment to something else. And that's why Rachel mentioned that she's gonna when they do the struggle with ESN sixteen. Is a placebo arm, so you see what the treatment effect is. So I actually think that if they had a placebo arm here, this group of people would be doing a lot better than the placebo arm. So I'm trying to get the company that makes them trying to do a trial in progressive MS to see if it works. And one of the reasons why I think that is because of this particular graph. So interferons, some of you may be treated with interferon beta. So the people in the group in Barcelona did a trial of interferon beta in progressive MS. And they gave interferon, and this orange bar here in the middle is when they treated them with interferon for two years. And you can see when they gave them for two years, it made no difference. At the end of the two year period, the people on placebo and interferon beta were the same. So they said, oh, this drug doesn't work. <coughs> they stopped the trial. But they brought all these people back five years later, seven years. And when they analyzed them, they saw that the people that had been given interferon over a year had done better. The upper limb function was better. In other words, they could use the thing called an iron hole peg test. You've got to put these little pins into these holes. It's a mark, it's a fun, it's a outcome for upper limb function. Their cognition, in other words, their memory and their ability to calculate and think was better. And similarly, they had not lost as much brain, because the brain shrinks in MS, and it was shrunk much slower. So in other words, two years of interferon treatment here had a benefit at seven years. And I think the reason that this happens is it takes much, much longer in progressive MS to get the answer. <clears throat> so you've got to do trials for more than two years. And most of the trials that have been done in MS, have been, for progressive disease, have been done for two, and some for three years. So we call this therapeutic lag. And I think what it's telling us is that progression of the disease getting worse, yeah, is due to inflammation occurring there. So if you suppress inflammation, yeah, you have to look over there for the effect. For the effect. <clears throat> you all understand that? So it just takes much longer to get the answer in progressive disease. So we hope you're going to learn from this. And I think the reason for that is it's got to do with how we measure the air. So that most of the people we, we worry about it is we use this thing called the disability score, the EDSS stands for the Expanded Disability Score. And when you've got progressive MS, that's completely dominated by walking. So the score is essentially a walking scale when we use it in progressive MS. And you can see that um, pro progression moves up from the legs upwards. And I think the reason for that is it's got to do with how long the nerves are in the, in the brain. So the longer the nerve, the more likely it is to be affected by MS. And it's simply a, a, a numbers game. Because MS causes lesions all over again, if you've got a very long nerve fiber, it's more likely to get more lesions on it. If you've got a short nerve fiber, it's less lesions. It's like throwing darts at a dartboard. Okay? So it's much more likely to hit longer fibers and shorter fibers. So the problem with once the legs are moving on, <clears throat> it's very difficult to modify them because they've lost the ability to recover function. It's got to do with what's called reserve. They've got no reserve. Whereas the other systems are still working. And this is probably why in that other trial, 
There was a positive light coming in the upper arms because the upper arms hadn't entered the progressive phase. Yet. So we've got to start thinking differently about progressive MS. In other words, if you're progressing in your legs and your arms are still fine, we shouldn't worry about your legs in terms of the outcome. We should look at the arms. So we should try and change our way we try. This is one of the things we're trying to do. We're trying to lobby the regulators, the people that license these drugs. They call themselves the European Medicine Agency, and in America it's called the FDA, to change the way we do trials so we can actually protect other pathways. <coughs> So why should we just let people with progressive MS who've got walking difficulties continue to get worse when we can, when we really we should be saying to them, actually we can protect your upper limb function, we should keep you using your arms and your leg, your arms, and we should make sure you don't develop swallowing problems and keep your cognition in place. So similarly, we need to move you know, our outcome measures away from what we can measure. So this is kind of why I, I, I like this picture of the start. A drawing a couple of years back, it's called the Therapeutic Pyramid. Uh, it talks about MS being an iceberg. And most of you know that for every clinical relapse you have in MS, it, maybe 10 lesions have come on the scan, come and go without being aware of them. So this is why we're beginning to now monitor the disease using MRI scans. But even then, below that, there are things we're not monitoring uh, in practice anymore. For example, the shrinkage of the brain we're not monitoring. And Monica mentioned to you the lumbar puncture to test to measure this protein here in front of it. So I think what we are going to be moving towards in clinical trials is measuring these things that actually are much better measures of the pathology of that, what's going on. So neuroprotection. So we actually think, and we kind of know now, that the driver is inflammation. So this beautiful slide that comes from a, a Cleveland clinic um, using very clever microscopy techniques under the microscope shows you what happens inside an acute brand new MS lesion. So this is a pathology study of someone who died of MS. And they took out one of the inflamed lesions and they scanned it up. And that green dot, that green dot is called an axon, axon bulb, a neuronal bulb. And what's happened is the nerve's been cut. It sealed itself off and all the contents have spawned this bulb like a balloon and it can't go off to the end. And that's what we call an axonal transection bulb. The, the one beneath it is an actually intact fiber, but you can see that where the green is, it's been stripped of its myelin. <clears throat> okay, in between there you have the yellow and orange and, and red. That's the nerve fiber in yellow and the red is the myelin. And this particular fiber has been stripped of its myelin, but it's still working probably. Now that particular nerve fiber is going to have to work hell of a hard in the future because it's got no myelin on it and it takes a lot of energy to send out electrical impulses. And we think this particular fiber, because it's been damaged now, is being programmed to die in the future. To die in the future. <clears throat> so we... So we need... Two things we need to do, we need to be able to protect this nerve from dying. Okay, so this is why we need to have therapies in what we call acute sudden onset MS. I put a pair of scissors there, because some people talk about this being an inflammatory scissors. I also put a shredder in there because it's like a paper shredder, it shreds the nerve fibers. I get criticized because I call this I call MS the shredder because it shreds nerve fibers. People don't like using that term. But I didn't invent that term, you know that? Who's watched the movie, who's watched the, the series West Wing? Yeah. Okay. Remember the term shredder? Because Jed Bartlett had, the yeah. President of the United States had MS, and he was having a fight with his wife, and his wife shouted at him, and he was forgetting about the shredder in his head, the MS. And this is when he wanted to stand for a second term, and she didn't, want, she didn't want him to stand for a second term. So she used the term shredder, it's a very nice term. So we need to actually stop that shredder working acutely. And then also, this fiber now that's going to be programmed to die in the future, it's kind of like what we call the slow burn, we need to stop that fiber from dying. So we need two strategies. We need to switch off the inflammation, and then we need to give drugs to protect that. And that's what the principle of your protection is. So, so we talk about this as being acute neuroprotection and chronic neuroprotection. And acute neuroprotection 
I'll just put it out. It's like stroke. <clears throat> so I'm not sure if you know anyone who's had a stroke. So we've got therapies for stroke, but you have to get the therapies in in the very first few hours. If you don't get in quickly enough, it's too late. We call that, it's called an ischemic penumbra, penumbra. And we've shown the same thing, my, my, my colleague, the mouse doctor, David Baker, has shown in, in, in his animal model of MS, that if, it, if you get acute inflammation and you don't put the neuroprotective drugs in within hours, or well, days in the mouse, there's no point you put in a minute, all the damage is done. And so because of the, and he, and he showed in his animal model that you have to get the drugs in within three days to protect the nerve fibers. If you wait more than three days, it's too late. And this is exactly why we did that trial at uh, Monica Convention, optic neuritis trial. So when you get inflammation in the optic nerve, how many of you had optic neuritis? So everybody who has optic neuritis, on average, when you recover from optic neuritis, you've lost 20% of your nerve fibers, one in five. And we know that because we can actually measure the thickness of the nerve afterwards, or we can count the fibers using this technique uh, of OCT written in the back of the eye. So one lesion in the optic nerve destroys 20% of the fibers on average. So the question is, could we protect those fibers by giving the drug? Uh, and this is, you're looking at this technique called OCT. So blue means you've lost fibers, and you can see in the right eye here, this, this is like a mountain peak, this is measuring the nerve. All that underneath there is the nerve fibers in the retina, in the optic nerve. And this is a normal eye. On the left, you can see lovely and green, it's been color coded for you, and blue means you've lost fibers. So that's more than actually, this particular attack is much more than 20%. So this particular attack looks like that individual's lost 50%. And that's what happens, 20% is an average. So some people will lose more than 20% and some people less. And the question is, could we give a drug to make this peak higher? And that's exactly what we did. We used phenytoin, the drug that's used for epilepsy. And we had to get the drug into the system within two weeks because we worked out that two weeks was probably equivalent to three days in the animal. So people come in with acute optic neuritis, we'll then give them the phenytoin, to see if we can protect those nerves, stop the shredder. And we actually had a positive result. We presented the results at the American Academy meeting. And believe it or not, <coughs> this is looking at the affected eye. You see this little average red dot there, red dot there? 30% protection. <coughs> so instead of losing 20% of their nerve fibers, they lost about 13% of their nerve fibers compared to the placebo that lost 20%. So this is actually a proof of concept that we can now use these drugs to at least protect the fibers. Now what you've got to realize is over time, with all these lesions coming and going, every time you lose, say, 20% of the fibers in that lesion, if we can protect 30% of the time, that's going to make a big difference in the long term. So what we're now trying to do is get one of the drug companies to give us a new drug, okay, a novel drug, that we can do another trial like this and then also put it onto that our uh, anti-inflammatory drugs in everybody with MS to try and delay the nerve fiber loss that occurs with the disease. It's called neuroprotection. And then Monica's mentioned chronic, uh, Monica, Monica's really mentioned the chronic neuroprotection we're trying to do. This is our animal model of MS. We, we're very proud of this model. This is David Baker's life, life work. The animals go through relapses and remissions, just like MS, and after about four relapses, four attacks, they go into the secondary progressive phase. And these little animals develop relapses and we can score their relapses. And, really. and so this is because of this model of MS that we've been able to test all these concepts and show that these concepts work. So we're not coming into patients, or people with this disease, uh, without some underlying principle that we think these drugs will work. And the phenytoin that went into humans with MS had gone through the animal model, so we had proof of principle that it was going to work. <coughs> oh, well, I'll leave this. <coughs> so this is just to say to you that we're not forgetting about progressive MS. So this is just that cartoon Monica showed, just to show you how many trials are running at the moment. So this is going from asymptomatic MS all the way through to the progressive forms of the disease. And so in progressive MS, there's lots of activity. My worry, though, is a lot of these trials are too short. Like I said to you, I think because they're too short, they may be negative. 
And one of the trials that came back negative is in Goleman. Is anybody on Jelenia here? The other name? So Jelenia is a drug that's given in relapsing disease. So because of the mode of action of the drug, the company put it into primary progressive disease. And uh, there it is over there. Uh, you know, the top left in Goleman. They put it to primary progressive disease and unfortunately the trial uh, was reported in April as being negative. And the, and the average time in the trial was just shy of three years. So maybe it was too short, I don't know. So that trial was negative. There's another trial that we're going to get the results very soon. It's a drug called Oprilizumab. We should get the report of that before the end of the year. And the good news is our producer man has just been announced that the two trials in relapsing disease are positive. And the primary progressive trial is just slightly behind, and we'll get the results uh, later on in the year. There's this drug called Aquinamod. This drug is actually interesting in that it slows down the shrinkage of the brain. It's been tested in relapsing disease as well, but we're actually currently recruiting for a trial in uh, primary progressive disease for that as well. Secondary progressive disease, a lot of activity. There's a drug called Tysabri that's licensed in relapsing disease. That trial will report out early next year. There's a drug called Saponamid, which is related to Fingolamid, that's in secondary progressive disease. There's a drug called Dimethyl Fumarate, it's called Tecfidera, it's available for relapsing disease. We are actually currently recruiting uh, in secondary progressive disease there as well. So this is a promotional study. And then there's the SMART study, which you've already heard about. We're going a little bit earlier with our Proximus trial, because we actually think the earlier you treat progressive disease, the better the, the more likely you are to get a positive outcome. And we actually want to treat progressive disease even earlier, so we're trying to get funding for a trial to treat progressive disease before it even becomes symptomatic. <clears throat> and one of the things that we begin to realize is that progression is probably there from the very beginning of this disease, and it only becomes manifest and the fibers have lost a certain percentage. So there's, there's loss of nerve fibers that are occurring throughout the disease. So we actually want to actually start treating progressive disease in the middle. <clears throat> what we really want to do is prevent this. So this is my world, this is my world here of MS. Have you all seen my tube here? It's very complicated, eh? Huh? Anyway, you start off at, at risk, and then you get asymptomatic disease. And we know that people have asymptomatic disease. Some people come to... Some people die post-mortem. They've got MS in their brains and they've never been diagnosed in life. And we know that when you have your first clinical attack, like optic neuritis, and we do a brain scan, most people have got lesions that have been there for years already. So they've had the disease long before they've had their first attack. So there is an asymptomatic phase to this disease. Then we've got the CIS, which is the first clinical attack, and then you go through minimal, moderate, severe impairment, and, uh, and we talk about the terminal phase of the disease as well. But as you go along this course of the disease, you have this blue line, and this blue line is all the symptomatic problems that you have from MS. Spasticity, pain, cognitive problems, depression, anxiety, etc. So we can treat this disease very early and stop that from happening and hopefully prevent it. So this is the whole concept of treating the disease earlier. And what we try to do is learn the lessons from our colleagues in rheumatology. Who knows somebody with rheumatoid arthritis? So the rheumatologists are 15 to 20 years ahead of the MS doctors because they've had their therapies that are very effective for that much longer than us. And they've realized that if you treat it rheumatoid arthritis very effectively early on, you know, what they would call rapid diagnosis, rapid therapy, they can stop the joints becoming damaged. And in rheumatology now, the number of joint replacements is plummeted by 80%. <coughs> So the good news is if you have rheumatoid arthritis, the choice of having damaged joints, you know, we don't have that philosophy yet in MS. We're trying to get neurologists to treat MS like they do in rheumatology. Everybody in MS should be given their therapies and go on to treatments as soon as possible to try and protect the brain. That's our current strategy. And hopefully we will to uh, prevent the need of these. So these are what I call exoskeletons. They're coming soon to, 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 to the world. Um, they're really available in the United States. This is technology that's been developed by um, the US military, actually, to help people walk without, walk, uh, without wheelchairs. But that's not, to, that's not really what we should be doing, don't you think? We should be preventing people needing exoskeletons, in my opinion. So, the moment, so we need to start lobbying people 
to, so we can get access to these treatments earlier, uh, definitely uh, uh, before they develop any disability. So I hope I've convinced you that um, we're not forgetting about progressive MS. There's lots of activity happening in the progressive MS space, because that's where the unmet need is. We really have to uh, test these treatments and show that they work so we can get drugs to people with progressive MS. So the whole idea of this meeting is to let you know about the, the work we're doing, and if anybody's eligible for those trials, we would gladly screen you for the trials. And um, uh, we'll leave our cards behind and we'll take questions. Thank you very much.